Whilst having an intuitive understanding of the basic principles of an object is incredibly useful, it often isn't enough for us to feel confident tinkering with it. For that, we need a more rigorous and watertight understanding of the object and how it operates under the hood. The preliminary lecture in this series has put us in this situation with categories. We've seen the motivation behind them, described an intuitive definition of one, and we even used this definition to construct a mathematical proof. However, to unlock the maximum potential of category theory, we need to rigorously build the definition of a category from the ground up. This may sound daunting, but if we use the intuition we've already established, it shouldn't be too difficult at all. We currently understand a category as some objects with various arrows between them that satisfy rules concerning composition, associativity, and identity. Let's turn this into a formal definition and explain some terminology along the way. We'll say that a category consists of a collection of objects and a collection of arrows. For any arrow in our category, let's call it F, we know that it must start and end at an object. We'll call the starting object the domain of F, written as DOM F, and the ending object the codomain of F, written as COD F. We normally write the domain and codomain for an arrow after a colon, with a little arrow going from the domain to the codomain. Hopefully you recall from a previous lecture that the very essence of category theory is the composition of these arrows. From a diagram, we've seen that any time the end of one arrow is the start of another arrow, there must be an arrow in our category that is the composition of these two arrows, that goes straight from the start of the first to the end of the second. To explain this behaviour formally, we can use the language of domains and codomains. We say that for any two arrows, F from A to B, and G from B to C, crucially, where the codomain of F equals the domain of G, there must be an arrow G follows F from A to C in our category, that is, with the domain of F and the codomain of G. In instances where two arrows do not have this common middle object, their composition is simply not defined. Now, for composition to be mathematically useful, we need to impose some extra rules on our category. Firstly, we require that composition is associative. Put mathematically, this says that for any three composable arrows, H, G and F, the arrow H follows the composition of G and F must equal the same arrow as H composed with G follows F. Last up, identity. We require that for any object A in our category, there must be an arrow ID with its domain and codomain being A. This arrow is called the identity arrow of A. This identity arrow must be the unit of composition, which means that for any arrow F from A to B, it must be the case that F follows the identity arrow of A is F, and the identity arrow of B follows F is also F. It's important to notice the order of composition here. We can't compose the identity arrow of A on the left, as then there would no longer be a common middle object, and so their composition wouldn't be defined. And that's it, a definition of a category that is almost mathematically rigorous. Well, the only thing missing is some technicality surrounding what I mean when I say a collection of objects and arrows. We made the effort to learn some fundamental set theory last lecture, so why don't I say that a category should consist of a set of objects and a set of arrows? You have a man named Bertrand Russell to thank for that. 
Essentially, while sets can contain an infinite number of things, not everything can fit into a set. Russell found that constructing some fairly innocent sounding sets lead to massive logical paradoxes, which mathematicians tend to want to avoid. I recommend having a look at Russell's paradox if this interests you, but rest assured that whilst we're dealing with informal collections of objects and arrows, there is a completely rigorous definition of these collections using so-called classes, but this is a pure technicality that we will ignore. In the last lecture, I gave an extremely brief overview of some examples of categories. But now that we have a solid understanding of how a category is defined, let's have a look at a few examples again, this time paying attention to how they satisfy our definition. To start with, let's have a look at the category of sets and functions, which is often called set. In set, our objects are sets, such as the set of shapes or the set of natural numbers. And our arrows are functions, like the function that maps each shape to the number of sides it has. The composition in our category is functional composition, defined by, for any element in our first set, first mapping it to an element in the second set, then mapping that element to an element in the third set. In our example, the composite map even follows sides would map a shape onto true or false, depending on whether it has an even number of sides. Notationally, for any function f from a to b, and any element x that is in the set a, we write the element in b that x is mapped to as f of x. This means that for a composite function g follows f, acting on an element x in a, the element x is first mapped to f of x, then f of x is mapped to g of f of x. This also gives an explanation of why composition is seemingly written backwards. We write g follows f when composing two arrows, even though the path through the category goes f, then g. This is because in categories like set, where we have maps as arrows, we write g follows f of x as g of f of x, which is also in this backwards order. Composition defined like this is associative, and satisfies our requirements concerning when we are allowed to compose arrows, so it is a valid composition operation in our category. Now we have to ensure that the laws of identity hold. Firstly, is there an identity function defined on every set? Without too much thought, we can realise that there is. Just define the identity function on any set is the function that maps each element in that set to itself. This also satisfies our unit law, that this identity function is the unit of composition. To verify this, just take any old function f from a to b, then take an element x in a, and find where this element is mapped to when we do f follows id on a of x. We know, by the definition of composition in set, that this equals f of id on a of x. But we also know that id on a of x is just x, as the identity arrow maps any element in a to itself. Then we are left with f of x. As any element x in a is mapped to f of x, f follows id on a is exactly the same function as f. Why not try to finish the proof that id is the unit of composition? by showing that the function id on b follows f has exactly the same mapping as f. So we've shown that set really is a category, which should come as no surprise considering we were introduced to the notion of a category by abstracting set theory. Next up, let's look at a really interesting category. Let's look at the category of proofs. The objects in our category are going to be propositions. A proposition here means some statement which can be true or false. 
As an example, we could have the proposition, Bob is wearing a hat. Considering that Bob is indeed wearing a hat, this proposition is true. We can also build new propositions from old ones. For example, the propositions it is sunny and Bob is wearing a hat can be combined to make the proposition if it is sunny, Bob wears a hat. We denote this with a special arrow between the two propositions called implication. In general, for any two propositions P and Q, we write the proposition if P is true, then Q is also true, as P implies Q. All possible propositions would be the objects in our category. Before I say what the arrows are in this category, I want to introduce the concept of proof. Suppose we have two propositions, let's call them P and Q. It may be the case that logically, Q follows directly from P. We say that there is a rule of inference that the conclusion Q logically follows from the premise P. In this case, we write P above a little line with Q below it. Then we define proof, or deduction, as the process of chaining these rules of inferences together to prove that a proposition is true, given that the premises are also true. As an example, let P be the proposition that it is sunny, and Q be the proposition that Bob is wearing a hat. Consider the proposition P implies Q. In other words, the proposition that if it is sunny, then Bob wears a hat. Then finally, we'll look at the new proposition, P and P implies Q, written with this little upside down V meaning and. This proposition would read as, it is sunny, and if it is sunny, Bob wears a hat. It shouldn't be too hard to see how, given the proposition P and P implies Q is true, then Q must be true. In other words, Bob must be wearing a hat. When we take away the complicated notation and read that in English, it's almost painfully obvious. This deduction is simply saying that if it is currently sunny, and we know that when it is sunny, Bob wears a hat, we can deduce that Bob is currently wearing a hat. In fact, if we forget everything about Bob's hat and the weather, this deduction for any arbitrary propositions P and Q is called modus ponens. Don't worry if you're not quite comfortable with these logical connectives, such as implies or and. We'll have plenty of time to explore these concepts in a later lecture, and we'll even see how we can define them within any category, and the result of that are surprising to say the least. Getting back to the matter at hand, deduction looks like a fantastic candidate for our arrows in the category of proofs, as it goes from one object to another. We just need deduction to be composable, and for there to be a unit of deduction for any proposition. As for composition, let us consider two deductions with a common middle proposition. Firstly, suppose the proposition A and B and C is true. In other words, each proposition A, B and C is true. Then we can prove that the proposition A and B is true, as both A and B are true by assumption. Secondly, assume A and B is true, that is, both A and B are true propositions. Then we can infer that A is true. Putting these together, we get a proof that A is true if we assume A and B and C is true. This makes complete sense, and hopefully convinces you that composition of proofs is well defined in this category. This is trivially associative, so it fits our criteria for composition in our category. All that's left now is to show that some sort of identity proof exists for every proposition. This is actually easier than it sounds. Let's take the arbitrary proposition, Alice has black hair. An identity deduction for this object must have the form, given that Alice has black hair, then Alice has black hair. 
Does such a deduction exist? Well, yes. Given that any proposition P is true, then of course it follows that P is true. This also clearly acts as a unit of deduction. I implore you to have a think about why if you don't feel comfortable with believing me. Just consider the identity deduction before and after any other composable deduction. I hope that this category really excites you like it did with me. It would be incredibly cool if we could use category theory to find some relationships between this category and another category. After a few more lectures, we'll do just that, and the implications of this relationship could change the way that we study and use mathematics forever. Let's take a look at one last category, one totally different to our category of proofs, the category induced from a functional programming language. As an extremely brief overview of this paradigm of programming, for those unfamiliar, Functional programming is the style of programming that concerns itself with data types and functions between them. You can think of data types as collections of values that are used to create a distinction between different kinds of data. For example, the Boolean data type contains two values, true and false, and the integer data type contains every integer. As some quick notation, we write the data type of a value after a colon. So we would write true colon boolean to say that true is of type boolean. Just like we could make new propositions using logical connectives in the category of proofs, we can combine types to make new types. As an interesting example, given any two types a and b, we can create a new type a arrow b which contains all functions that go from A to B. In the case of integers and booleans, there is a type integer to boolean, which contains functions such as isEven, the function that maps even integers onto true and odd integers onto false. Notice that this notation perfectly aligns with the notation used to write in arrows domain and codomain in a category which gives us a good hint of how to define the category associated with a programming language. Our objects are the data types of the language, and the arrows are the functions between them. The composition of any two functions f from a to b and g from b to c is defined in a similar fashion as in the category set. We apply the function g to the output of the function f. The identity function for a data type is simply the function that returns its input for any value in that data type. So now we have defined a category associated to a functional programming language. To fully flesh out the categories we've just seen, we need to look at how we can further abstract concepts from these distinct disciplines such as logical connectives and more complicated data types. We'll incrementally do this throughout this series, whilst continuing to see more relevant examples along the way. I think here is a good place to stop for now. We've successfully created a rigorous foundation for us to look at category theory and its implications, and we've seen some interesting examples of categories from mathematics, logic, and computer science. To make sure you don't miss further videos in this series, or indeed videos covering other areas of mathematics and computer science, please do feel free to leave a subscription. But until next time, goodbye.